Boa tarde, boa tarde, Jamila Ribeiro, Mabulácio Mauro, boa tarde, Melanie. Eu sou Natália Guerelos e a gente está começando hoje, então, a gravação do num programa especial da História em Quarentena, que vai ser divulgado é, no final dessa semana, que é a semana dedicada às questões raciais. Então eu vou apresentar o nosso projeto, que é o História em Quarentena. É um projeto nascido é, da razão, em razão e da necessidade é, de confinamento, de afastamento físico, é, que a atual crise sanitária do Covid acabou forçando o mundo em geral e o Brasil em particular. É, nós desejamos, com esse projeto, continuar é, esse empreendimento de divulgar o conhecimento histórico, mas também conhecimentos provenientes de outras é, ciências humanas e sociais, aproveitando é, das possibilidades oferecidas pelas ferramentas digitais para reforçar esse sentido de coletividade. Então, desde o dia 23 de março de 2020, nós entramos no ar de segunda a quarta-feira por meio do Facebook Live, com a participação de uma pesquisadora ou de um pesquisador, falando sobre algum tema, uma questão histórica inserida na temática geral que muda cada semana. E, além disso, cada semana tem um programa especial, que é um debate gravado por Skype entre diferentes especialistas com a intenção de discutir o tema proposto na semana. Então, durante a primeira semana do projeto, o tema transversal estava ligado à história das doenças, epidemias e pandemias. A segunda semana foi dedicada à temática violência de Estado e autoritarismo. Depois nós tratamos questões de arte e cultura. Na semana passada o tema foi para além da moral e dos bons costumes. E agora, na quinta semana do, do História em Quarentena, do projeto, o tema é questões raciais ontem e hoje. Nesse âmbito, nós propomos hoje um debate super especial, do qual nós estamos muito contentes, muito felizes, é, com a Djamila Ribeiro e com uma Mabulácio Mauro, no formato linguístico um pouco particular. Então, é, para explicar um pouco esse novo formato que nós vamos utilizar, a apresentação das participantes e as perguntas serão feitas nas línguas das participantes, em português e em francês, e as intervenções delas será, serão em inglês, para permitir um diálogo entre as duas, uma maior interação entre as duas nesse debate o que seria muito difícil em relação a esse, ao formato digital para a gente agora fazer a, uma interação que fosse numa tradução consecutiva. Ia ser muito mais complicado e demorado. Então, por isso, a gente escolheu o formato das perguntas em inglês e em francês e as respostas e interação em inglês. É, nós estamos convencidos que esse formato vai poder dar conta da imensa qualidade dessa conversa. Bonjour, bonjour à tous et bonjour Maboula et Jamila, Natalia. Euh, nous sommes vraiment très, très heureuses d'organiser ce, ce débat, ce débat aujourd'hui dans le cadre du projet Histoire en quarantaine, qui est né du nécessaire confinement et de la distanciation physique que la crise sanitaire liée au Covid-19 a rendu indispensable dans le monde entier et tout particulièrement au Brésil. Euh, nous souhaitons donc poursuivre le travail de diffusion des connaissances historiques, mais également de connaissances issues d'autres sciences humaines et sociales, en profitant, en essayant de profiter des possibilités offertes par les outils numériques euh, et aussi pour renforcer le sentiment de, de collectivité. Donc, depuis le 23 mars, nous avons proposé des conférences en direct euh, par Facebook Live, du lundi au mercredi, euh, avec la participation d'une chercheuse ou d'un chercheur spécialiste d'une question historique inséré au sein d'une thématique plus large, euh, et cette thématique, elle change chaque semaine. Et on propose également toutes les semaines un programme spécial, euh, un débat enregistré par Skype, donc comme euh, notre, le cas qui nous occupe aujourd'hui, avec différents spécialistes qui discutent donc de ces thématiques euh, hebdomadaires. Au cours de la première semaine du projet, la thématique transversale était liée de fait à l'histoire des maladies, des épidémies et des pandémies. On trouvait ça intéressant de commencer par euh, cette thématique-là. La deuxième semaine euh, a été dédiée à la réflexion sur la violence d'État et l'autoritarisme. Euh, ensuite, on a évoqué l'art et la culture, le thème « Au-delà de la morale et des bonnes mœurs ». Et donc, désormais, au cours de cette cinquième semaine du projet, les questions raciales hier et aujourd'hui. Donc, dans ce cadre, nous, nous proposons aujourd'hui, nous sommes très heureuses et heureux, parce que nous sommes deux présentes ici, mais le projet, on est cinq dans le projet, euh, nous sommes très heureuses et heureux de proposer ce débat avec euh, mesdames Jamila Ribeiro et Mabula Sumaoro dans un format linguistique 
un peu particulier puisque la présentation des participantes et les questions seront réalisées en portugais et en français par Natalia et moi-même, Mélanie. Et euh, les interventions auront donc lieu en anglais pour permettre une plus grande interaction qui serait rendue un peu difficile euh, dans le cadre d'une traduction consécutive. Nous sommes convaincus que ce format permettra de rendre compte de cette très très grande qualité des interventions. Voilà. Et je vais commencer donc à présenter Adjamila Ribeiro, notre première participante de ce débat. Adjamila est très connue au Brésil, donc... É, tudo que eu vou falar aqui, acho que não vai dar conta de tudo que ela já fez, mas eu vou falar uma, dar umas linhas gerais, então, né, do perfil da Jamila, que é filósofa, acadêmica, ativista, feminista e antirracista, foi voluntária na Educa Afro, instituição que viabiliza o ingresso dos alunos negros e de baixa renda ao ensino superior. A Jamila cursou filosofia na, UNE, na Unifesp, Universidade Federal de São Paulo, onde ela se formou em 2012 e em 2015 ela se tornou mestre em filosofia política pela mesma instituição, concentrando-se em teoria feminista. Escreveu o prefácio da edição brasileira de Mulheres, Raça e Classe, da filósofa negra e feminista Angela Davis. Em 2016, durante a gestão do prefeito, do Fernando Haddad, foi nomeada secretária adjunta de Direitos Humanos e Cidadania na cidade de São Paulo, e além disso tudo, Djamila é colunista do jornal Folha de São Paulo, da revista Marie Claire e do Carta Capital, além de ser autora de três livros, uh, O Lugar de Fala, que eu tenho aqui, e o Quem Tem Medo do Feminismo Negro, que a, a Melanie tem lá, <risos> eu, tenho, eu tenho a versão francesa também, <risos> estamos todos. E... É, e o mais recente, Pequeno Manu, Manual Antirracista. Além disso, a Djamila coordena um projeto muito importante, que é a coleção Feminismos Plurais, justamente dessa coleção, desse livrinho aqui, né? Que já tem quantos uh, números, não sei. É, hoje a gente lança o oitavo. Oitavo livro, fala. Donc, je vais commencer par présenter Jamila Ribeiro en français. Eh, Jamila Ribeiro, qui est, euh, entre autres choses, évidemment, philosophe, universitaire, militante féministe et antiraciste, qui était volontaire au sein de Edu Afro, qui est une institution qui rend possible l'entrée d'élèves noirs et issus des classes populaires et des quartiers périphériques au sein de l'enseignement supérieur. Donc, elle a suivi les cours de philosophie de l'Université fédérale de São Paulo, de laquelle elle a été diplômée en 2012. Et en 2015, elle y a obtenu un master en philosophie politique avec une attention toute particulière pour la théorie féministe. Elle a notamment été euh, l'auteur de la préface de l'édition brésilienne de l'ouvrage « Femmes, races et classes » de la philosophe et euh, militante Angela Davis. Et en 2016, pendant le mandat de Fernando Haddad à la mairie de São Paulo, elle fut nommée secrétaire adjointe aux droits humains et à la citoyenneté. Donc elle écrit très régulièrement pour divers périodiques brésiliens, le journal Folha de São Paulo, les revues Marie Claire et Carta Capital, en plus d'être l'autrice de trois ouvrages, L'Ogar de Fala, qu'on pourrait traduire par Lieu de parole, euh, Quem tem medo do féminisme negro, Qui a peur du féminisme noir, et Pequeno Manual Antiraciste, le petit manuel antiraciste. Et donc elle coordonne également euh, la collection Féminisme pluriel, dont euh, on est au 8e, euh, à la huitième publication. Voilà, entre autres, entre autres choses pour la présentation de Jamila Ribeiro. Et donc, je poursuis. Nous accueillons également aujourd'hui Madame Maboula Soumaoro. Nous sommes très, très contentes de vous accueillir toutes les deux. Maboula Soumaoro, euh, maîtresse de conférences en langue et littérature anglaise et anglo-saxonne à l'Université de Tours, spécialiste de l'étude des diasporas africaines en France. Vous êtes l'une des principales voix qui consacre une réflexion d'envergure euh, à la question noire ici en, en France. Donc vous avez enseigné au sein de très très nombreux, nombreux établissements, ce serait compliqué de tous les citer, mais euh, entre autres en France et aux États-Unis, on peut citer Sciences Po Paris, Sciences Po Reims, le Barnard College, l'Institut de recherche en études africaines-américaines de l'Université de Columbia, euh, Stanford University, etc. Et la liste est très longue et c'est également important de signaler que vous avez enseigné au sein de nombreux établissements pénitentiaires. Euh, vos recherches sont centrées sur les études nord-américaines et afro-américaines, sur les diasporas africaines et la question des nationalismes noirs atlantiques, donc dans l'espace atlantique. Je voulais aussi signaler que de 2013 à 2016, vous avez été membre du Comité national pour l'histoire et la mémoire de l'esclavage 
Et depuis 2013, vous êtes la présidente de l'association Black History Month, dédiée à la célébration de l'histoire et des cultures du monde noir. Et donc, votre dernier livre, Natalia, au décembre, <rire> Le triangle et l'hexagone, réflexion sur une identité noire, donc est paru très récemment, en février 2020, aux éditions de La Découverte, et donc vous y interrogez euh, pas mal de questions liées justement à l'identité noire en France. Voilà. Então, eu passo a apresentação da professora Mabula Sumauro. Nós convidamos hoje também a participar do debate. Ela é professora adjunta em Língua e Civilizações Inglesas e Anglo-Saxônicas na Université de Tours, na França, especialista nos estudos das diásporas africanas na França. É, ela é uma das principais vozes que se dedica a uma reflexão mais ampla sobre a questão da raça no país. Ensinou em várias instituições na França e no mundo todo, principalmente nos... E é, a gente pode citar o Instituto de Estudos Políticos de Paris, é, o Instituto de Estudos Políticos de Reims, é, a, Universi a Universidade de Colômbia, a Universidade de Stanford, etc., etc. E a Mabula também ensinou em várias é, prisões, em várias é, instituições é, penitenciárias. A, a pesquisa dela é centrada nos estudos norte-americanos e afro-americanos, é, também no estudo da, das diásporas africanas e na questão dos nacionalismos negros atlânticos. E entre 2013 e 2016, é, a Mabula foi membro do Comitê Nacional para a História e a Memória da Escravidão, aqui na França, e desde 2013 ela é presidenta da associação Black History Month, é, que é dedicada à celebração da história e das culturas do mundo negro. Então, o último livro que a Natália mostrou, que seria traduzido como o Triângulo e o Hexagono, que é uma referência ao triângulo da, da, da escravidão, do comércio transatlântico e o formato geográfico que se, seria supostamente da França, Hexagono, é, Le Triangle et l'Hexagone, Reflexion sur une identité noire, que foi publicado agora em fevereiro de 2020, e questiona a identidade negra na França. E eu acho que uhum. a gente encontrou de volta a Natália. Okay. <risos> o computador desligou. Eu completei, eu completei a apresentação, então, em português, da ah. Abula. É, então, é, je, donc, eu gostaria de vous remercier vraiment, uh, todas as duas, très, très sinceramente, de participar. E então, vamos começar com a la toute primeira questão do debate. Natália, nos entendemos. Eu preciso só restaurar a página aqui, peraí. Eu já vou. Eu vou agradecer também em português, fazer o papel da Natália em, no idioma português. É, Jamila, a gente queria realmente agradecer muito a sua presença, a presença de vocês duas. E a gente vai começar com a primeira pergunta, com essa lógica de que a, a Natália vai fazer a pergunta em português, eu vou traduzir a pergunta em francês e a Mabula vai responder primeiro, depois a gente sempre vai ficar intervertindo as a, as é, posição de fala, né? Quem fala primeiro, quem fala segundo e, e responde. Então, tá. Okay. Eu vou começar, então, com a primeira pergunta. É, a gente vai partir de um, de um conceito que tem sido bastante utilizado no Brasil e lido nos últimos anos, anos bem recentes, que é o conceito de necropolítica, inicialmente usado num artigo publicado por Rachid Mbambé em 2003, na revista Public Culture, em 2006, em Raison Politique. Depois, noção epônima do livro Necropolitics, publicado em 2011 e traduzido no Brasil em 2018, é, que já teve, então, depois vários desdobramentos. A questão para as nossas convidadas é como pensar, é, a partir dessa interpretação e dessa análise da necropolítica, que em grandes linhas falaria desse, dessa questão do poder do Estado de decidir quem deve viver e quem deve morrer, em relação ao atual contexto de pandemia e confinamento nas diversas realidades vividas pelas nossas convidadas. Donc la première question, que je traduis tout de suite en français, euh, on va partir euh, du, enfin, de, du concept de nécropolitique euh, qui, qui a été initialement euh, publié par M. Achille Membé dans un article en 2003, puis après en 2006 dans Raison politique, et qui est la notion éponyme de l'ouvrage Necropolitics, 
qui a été traduit récemment au Brésil en 2018 et qui a fait beaucoup parler de lui, qui a une influence considérable dans sa traduction brésilienne, Necropolitica. Donc la question d'aujourd'hui, de, dans le cadre de ce débat, ce serait euh, celle de réfléchir à la manière avec laquelle on pourrait adapter l'interprétation et l'analyse de cette nécropolitique, donc en d'autres termes du pouvoir de décider qui doit vivre ou mourir, au contexte à la fois français et brésilien, euh, de manière générale et aussi tout particulièrement dans, le, dans le, la situation actuelle de pandémie et de confinement et de toutes les, toutes les questions que ça implique en fait dans euh, le rapport des autorités aux populations. Maboula, on va commencer par, par vous du coup. Euh, dans ce... Ok. Um, so perhaps a few remarks regarding Achille Bembe and his work uh, and his works that are being greater known uh, whether one talk about France or Brazil because um, the circulation of knowledge, the circulation of publications I think raises a number of questions. We're talking about an, um, let's say a publication dating back to 2003 that is being analyzed, understood, circulated further translated today in 2020. Mm -hmm. So that, that is to say, we are talking about an essay that was published 17 years ago, right? And we are trying to delve into the significance of this, um, you know, these reflections. And if we were to go back to the, let's say, uh, the fame of Ashid Bembe, we could also go back to uh, 2000 and the publication of uh, On the Past Colony. And if On the Past Colony was published in, 20, uh, in 2000, um, it was published in English first. And then uh, years later, particularly around uh, Critique de la Raison Negre, uh, there was greater attention paid in France and perhaps francophone places, um, uh, an increased attention paid to the works by Achille Bembe. And now we have to wait 2018 for Achille Bembe's Uh, thought to reach Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. So what does it tell us about the production and circulation of these, um, these valuable reflections? I'm not saying that in 2020, we don't have to pay attention to texts dating back to uh, 1600 or 1700 or 1800 and that are still unknown, but I'm just saying or maybe noticing that on particular issues and particularly on racial issues and on issues related to blackness, it takes, it seems to be taking even more time, right? Um, so the question of, um, so how do we say in English, necropolitics? Is it necropolitics in English? Uh, th this is the, 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 the reflection, the idea, philosophical question even, on who has the right, who is entitled to life and death in our modern Western societies, right? Who is allowed to live? Who is encouraged or pushed to die? And of course, these fundamental philosophical existential question cannot be dissociated from this racial question. The two questions might seem, you know, totally different and totally apart for some, when to me and to others, it really uh, takes us back to the root of the issue and to the root of the signification of the definition of what race has meant in, we in Western society, what race and racial construction, processes of racialization have meant for human bodies since the modern times, right? So to be white and to be black are the categories that I'm going to use. Um, And that do, not, that do not mean that there are no categories in between that, that spectrum, but they are the, the two, let's say, fundamental categories, right? The goal is to be white. Uh, whiteness is to be understood and associated with power uh, and domination. And blackness is to be understood and associated with inferiority and, and lack of power. But whiteness and blackness are also the categories that need in the context of uh, these, these necro politics to be understood in um, relation to those matters of life and death. To be, uh, to be white is to be fully alive, is to be alive to begin with, and to have a full life. So a full life means to have uh, money to live your life, to have housing, to have access to education, to have access to, you know, health, Uh, 
uh, I want to say healthy health. Uh, to, to, uh, so all these are what constitute a full life, right? And blackness needs to be understood to the lack of all the elements that I have uh, mentioned and that amount to death, right? So if we understand these um, you know, fundamental um, elements, then we can question uh, necropolitics today, 2020, in France or in Brazil or in any other place of this Western world. And we can stop t paying attention to the issue of police brutality. We can uh, start paying attention to the issue of incarcer incarceration or mass incarceration. We can, in this um, you know, moment of uh, COVID, we can pay attention to health issues. Who is going to stay alive? Who is going to die? Who is going to be treated and cured? And who is not going to be cured? Who is going to uh, be, um, I don't know, protected from that virus and be uh, confined at home and, 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 and have the time and luxury to uh, record um, a conversation and a debate uh, that gives us time and the opportunity to, to think through those issues and who is currently, as we speak, working and working outside to our benefit. So these larger questions of blackness and whiteness need to be understood in relation to, uh, to our bodies and how those racial questions have been anchored in our bodies. But they, they are also concepts, right? What I mean by concepts means that you can have a black skin and a white skin and not experience, um, you know, our organized, I mean, our lives in our organized societies um, only fitting those racial categories, right? Which means that as a black person, I can be protected from the virus today and not being working outside, right? But, I'm, I'm, but I think that it is, it is very important to take into account both the bodies and the concepts that those processes of racialization have invented. So I think that this, this question of necropolitics is really a matter of, of, of life and death. Life and death, as it's been explored recently by people such as Norma Najari, for instance, in, 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 uh, with his publication, uh, La Dignité ou la Mort, uh, uh, which is an exploration of, of, of what those processes of racialization have meant throughout history. And ultimately, it's really a matter of life and death. Life, um, life and death or greater access to a full life or easier access to death. And death at the hands of uh, the, the, the state, the government, uh, death at the, 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 at the hands of you know, multiple institutions, the ones that I've named, um, you know, the police, uh, death um, at, the, at the hand of, uh, of COVID, of COVID-19, who is going to stay alive? And those, I think that these, these questions unfold on so many levels. We can talk about race, we can talk about gender, we can talk about age, right? This has been an issue. Are the elderly going to stay alive or are the elderly going to be sacrificed because we don't have enough beds and we don't have any, enough medication? So I think that the, 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 this concept of necropolitics is, is of, of, of high significance and, and is um, a good tool, a good analytical tool to, uh, to, think, to think through the so societies we are living in uh, today. Ultimately, this is what it's about. Who stays alive and who, uh, who thrives while being alive and who doesn't thrive while alive and who dies more easily without uh, gaining or without being granted attention. Your, I mean, your life does not matter, right? We could talk about Black Lives Matter uh, in the United States. Whose lives matter and whose lives do not? So this is how I understand. Um, Ashley Bembe's work and Nick on necropolitics. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking English is always a challenge. I will do my best mm -hmm. to be understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I totally agree. And I think in Brazil, it, um, you have to highlight how in Brazil it's the country uh, with the largest number of Africa diaspora and, and how it's important also to talk about indigenous people in Brazil, indigenous and black people in Brazil, 
that are suffering uh, genocide, historically genocide. So now with this moment, with this pandemic moment, people in Brazil are, you know, speaking about the inequalities and how we needed to create solidarity net for to help all the people. Um, but the thing is, um, they do not discuss for me the fundamental topic, which is uh, distribution of, you know, the wealth, because here in Brazil, it's a very, uh, we have a lot of inequalities in Brazil, and people think that, oh, I can, now in this moment, we need to help people to stay at home. Of course, you, you can do everything you, you can do, you know, but people are not discussing races and how races structure all the society, all the social relations in Brazil, and that how Brazil was the last country in America to end slavery and how it impacts the life of black people and indigenous people in Brazil. Um, so I think it's a moment, you know, to face the myth of the racial democracy is the moment to, um, to face this fake idea that Brazil is, uh, you know, the, the land of joy and the land of the, of the harmony of the races and, and to, to do the right discussion, I think. Um, we needed to discuss um, the politics of death. We needed to discuss that Brazil is the country that has a high number of assassination of the black youth. We need to discuss how black women in Brazil are being um, killed by the state in terms of uh, public health, uh, in terms of a feminicide. So to defend the public health system in Brazil, for us, it's a black project. You know, it's a racial project to, def to, to defend the, the, the public health system. When you, uh, I see people defending that without discussing that black people, most of the black people depend on the health system in Brazil. And I think it's, for me, this is the, the topic that I want to, um, to raise here in Brazil. If you are discussing about health, if you're discussing about education or economic or you know, any kind of topic, we needed to put it in a racial perspective. And um, it's impossible to discuss economy without discussing races and how it impacts black people's lives. It, it's um, impossible to discuss about um, um, people, um, homeless people, without discussion the racial, without the racial perspective. Most of the people who are homeless in Brazil are black. So I think it's um, it's not a it's not a specific debate. It's the it's the main debate, the racial debate. And I think now when you have most of the black people dying with, um, uh, dying due to um, coronavirus, when you have the first person who died in Brazil was a domestic worker. Um, when uh, most of the favelas, the slums in Brazil, most of the people there do not have uh, basic sanitary. Uh, and you say to people, wash your hands, and there are some communities in Brazil that people do not have water, for example. So I think it's, um, uh, for me, it's a moment to discuss um, seriously about races and how in Brazil it's impossible to have um, uh, a serious conversation without discussing the politics of death and how um, black people in Brazil, the majority of the people in Brazil, um, still are not have access to basic rights. I think it's the moment to discuss that without, you know, uh, like I, I, I am seeing like, oh, this company, the, the banks in Brazil are going to donate um, $1 billion, $1 billion reais to help people in this moment. But the banks, are the responsible of uh, one of the responsible on this crisis, this, this capitalism crisis that you have in Brazil. We live in a country that you have the high taxes, uh, the banks applies the, the high taxes. So, and, uh, 
sometimes I think even the progressive side, um, some some kind of debate um, are you know so superficial, um, and they do not um, raise the main debate. And I think it's the moment to do that. And how before the pandemic time, black people were dying already, and how we can actually uh, have a left-wing people in Brazil who take racial debate seriously and, um, and not only, you know, to, 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 to see this topic as a, a specific topic as they are doing here in Brazil. Uh, no, we have to discuss about class. And for us, of course, class is, is, class is a very important subject, but for us, Black people, uh, the debate on class is debate on race and how you can put all this subject together and finally um, confront this idea that debate race in Brazil is a specific topic. I don't know if, I, if you understand me, I'm doing my best. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Ça nous, ça nous emmène à une autre question euh, qui est complètement liée en fait à la première, parce que là on parlait de, on parlait de, du contexte spécifique de la pandémie et on se rend évidemment compte que, enfin évidemment pour certaines personnes c'est pas évident, mais on se rend compte en tout cas que, que ces questions là elles sont d'autant plus exacerbées dans l'actuel contexte, mais elles ne naissent pas du contexte de pandémie. Et euh, la, la deuxième question qu'on qu voulait vous poser, donc, elle, elle, elle s'insère complètement dans cette réflexion. Euh, Jamila Ribeiro a apporté euh, au sein du débat brésilien sur ces questions euh, de race, euh, avec beaucoup de force, certaines réflexions et certains concepts qui ont émergé euh, de l'expérience notamment des femmes américaines en matière de racisme, comme celui de l'intersectionnalité par exemple et aussi de l'expérience brésilienne en matière de racisme, comme par exemple ce qu'on pourrait traduire par la ladina mefricanité, à peu près, euh, qui traite non seulement de la formation de la société et de la culture, mais aussi d'un inconscient et de pratiques euh, propres au métissage. Et, euh, encore là, on peut discuter du terme de métissage au Brésil, en France, ils n'ont pas les mêmes significations. Donc, euh, d'une manière un peu générale, comment on peut comprendre et comment on peut analyser les conséquences actuelles aujourd'hui, et donc pas uniquement dans le contexte euh, sanitaire actuel, mais donc de manière plus générale, dans mm -hmm. à l'époque contemporaine, comment on peut euh, comprendre ces conséquences de l'esclavage et de la traite transatlantique dans les différents continents donc, On va peut-être plutôt parler de la France et du Brésil d'un point de vue comparatif, mais ça peut être élargi aussi euh, au continent américain, au continent européen, au continent africain. Voilà, comment on peut faire une comparaison, une analyse un peu comparée des conséquences de la traite transatlantique à l'époque contemporaine actuellement, en tenant compte de ce qu'on vient de dire sur la question sanitaire, sur les questions sociales, les inégalités qui sont criantes et qui se, vont bien au-delà en fait, de, de, de la situation actuelle qu'on vit aujourd'hui. É, partindo então das questões que foram levantadas é, por vocês, eu acho que elas já se ligam diretamente à questão que a Melanie acabou de colocar e que eu vou colocar então em português, é, a partir de uma contribuição que a Djamila Ribeiro, entre outros intelectuais é, no Brasil, tem trazido com força para o debate, que é entre outras questões, mas uma das mais importantes talvez seja a reflexão surgida do contexto do feminismo norte-americano, o feminismo negro norte-americano, que é a questão da interseccionalidade, mas também da experiência brasileira com racismo, que é um conceito da, da Lélia Gonzalez, né, em torno da, da dinâmica africanidade, e que a Jamila menciona com frequência e tenta também é, discutir, que trata não só da formação da sociedade e da cultura, mas também do inconsciente é, mestiço, além de ser um conceito amplo também. Então, a questão, a parte um pouco dessa ideia, da gente pensar na, nas diferenças é, e, e aproximações que podem ser feitas da experiência da escravidão nos diversos continentes onde ela foi é, estrutural, fundamental, e aí na França, no Brasil, ah, nos Estados Unidos, no Caribe, enfim, e para tentar entender as consequências da escravidão e desse comércio transatlântico de corpos né, negros ah, a partir de um ponto de vista comparativo. E aí eu vou passar a palavra para a Djamila começar dessa vez. Hum. I think Lélia Gonzalez um, 
uh, was a very important um, thinker in Brazil, black feminist, and also Pan-Africanist. And, um, and the way she, she raised the idea um, and how it's important for us as black people in Latin America to think a transnational struggle with the other countries in the Latin America. And uh, because in Brazil, usually we, uh, we look um, for United States, the experience of the Black America, and I think it, when you say Black America, for me, um, it's very complex because you are also in America. Mm -hmm. And how United States domains the debate about the racial debate. Mm -hmm. And as we speak Portuguese in Brazil, you have this barrier because even Latin America, we are isolated from the other countries because the other countries they speak Spanish. Mm. And we only speak uh, this Portuguese in Brazil, even in Portugal. It's, it's different, the Portuguese. It's like the Brazilian Portuguese is different. We only speak in this country, this language. And how it's sometimes because of that, it's difficult um, to communicate with the other country. But Lélia Gonzalez, she was, even in the 8th and the 90s, um, uh, uh, bringing this, uh, this idea of a transnational struggle with other countries in Latin America. Uh, because here, in, for example, in Brazil, you have Candomblé, for example, it's an African-Brazilian religion. In Cuba, you have Santeria, they are very similar. How you can uh, think about all these um, cultures that, of course, are different, but that are similarities and how it's important for us as countries in the global south to discuss that. Um, even in the black movement in Brazil, uh, historically, most of the people have this idea of the United States. And I think Lélia Gonzalez, she break this idea. And of course, it's important for us to read Angela Davis, Patricia Hill Collins, they are very important to us because they are in the, uh, in the North, but they are not hegemonic there because they are black women there. So of course, what uh, their productions are very important to us, but how it's important to Brazil to learn with our own um, stories of resistance. Uh, Lela Gonzalez, um, she, she used to say that we not only share uh, stories of pain, we also share Histories of resistance, of struggles, and even in Brazil, people do not know too much about Quilombos. They do not know about Revolta dos Malês, about the Malês Revolt. They do not know about our the indigenous um, riots, the indigenous resistance. So people here, maybe they know about Paris, Comuna de Paris, Comuna de Paris, but they don't know about Quilombo dos Palmares, um, um, who during more than 100 years faced the, the power, faced the, the, the Portuguese colonization. So I think it's important for other Black people in the diaspora also to learn with Brazil, to learn with our stories of resistance, with Candomblé, for example, that the terreiros, the temples, they were very important to, to Black Brazilian people because there are space of resistance. There are spaces that, um, who kept the culture, who kept the culture of Orishas, the God and the Goddess, who were important to Black people that uh, for black, the Black mothers that, that couldn't have, couldn't, didn't have a place to, to leave their children to work. And the Tejeros did that for, for this woman. How the, the Tejeros not, is not only about religion, but also about the social uh, role in the community. And still now in Brazil, Tejeros are facing a very um, difficult time. People attack us, um, they demonize it, the Afro-Brazilian religion. But I am from Candomblé. I was born in a terreiro. And I know, and we know how terreiro was very important to the Brazilian Black people to, to resist in Brazil. So I think it's 
uh, what Lélia Gonzalez um, was saying is that how we are uh, a, Brazi uh, uh, a Brazil with a S, and that is a Brazil with a Z, you know, the Brazil that explored the idea of samba and the explored the idea of har harmony of races, that explored the idea of, you know, that we live um, that are not uh, that are not racial conflicts here, because we didn't have a legal apartheid, but we have institutional races in the stru structural races in Brazil, and um, stop looking um, outside all the time and look in, in start to learn with the indigenous people. We have in Brazil today about two hundred and five ethnic cities of indigenous people, and if I ask for um, for a person to name five, maybe she will not know. So how in Brazil today we are discussing about sustainability without, um, you know, having a conversation with indigenous people that are doing that forever and uh, uh, to live in harmony with nature and how to preserve the nature, to preserve, to think that that, that is not uh, dichotomic between people and nature. So. Also, we are looking to Europe or to United States again. Uh, you have a very Eurocentric academia in Brazil, a very Eurocentric uh, epistemologically dominated epistemic in Brazil, and um, uh, and how we needed to face this colonial idea. You have to face the epistemicid that you call epistemicid, the assassination of our knowledge, the assassination of, of our um, uh, our learnings in Brazil and how knowledge is not only what we learn in college, in the academia, knowledge is what we learn from the social movement, from the Ialorishas and the Babalorishas who are the priests of Candomblé. Learn is what we, um, knowledge is what we learn from indigenous people. So Lara Gonzalez was confront this idea of knowledge, established knowledge, and also inviting us to, to, to learn with our own experience of resistance and with the experience of resistance in Latin America. And um, of, of course, we, we learn from the United States, it's important for sure, but here we live in the color, in, in a country, um, which was colonized it. And, and the impact of that in our lives and the impact of that in the lives of the black people in Latin America. Okay. Um, thank you. So based on what um, Jamila just said and, and also the way she answered the previous questions, I think that one thing that we need to keep in mind and insist upon is the fact that these current you know, um, crisis is really simply highlighting pre-existing structure, right? This is the time of disclosure. This is the time of, uh, for revealing, the revealing of pre-existing -ex structure. And this also can help us better understand why this current crisis is so global. It is global because the existing pre-existing structures were global to begin with, and they of course take us back to this moment, historical moment of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, and we could even talk about the, um, the, the the slave trade in the Indian Ocean, right, uh, and other parts of the world. But our focus is going to be the Atlantic here. But the crisis is global because the structures and the institutions put into place were made global from the very inception of these modern times. Right. So the questions that we are dealing with right now in this time, uh, in those dark times, in these times of urgency, really take us back to the past and they can only take us back to the past. And the questions that we are gra grappling with and that, of course, as Jamila said, need to be taken, uh, need to be dealt with seriously, profoundly, right, deeply, um, are... I want to say ancient, not even old question, ancient question. I'm, I have in mind Eric Williams, uh, who I think in 1941, Eric Williams, a historian from Trinidad, 
who published Capitalism and Slavery. That was in 1941, right? We, we, we don't have to wait for the 21st century to find somebody, perhaps by coincidence, but I don't believe, but perhaps by coincidence, a black person from the Americas to have published his PhD dissertation that was devoted to this issue of the, 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 the mixing of the racial and the social question, right? People keep saying whether we're talking about Brazil or France. No, this is a racial issue. No, this has to be uh, you know, um, a social issue. These are the same issues. They can be racial, social, related to gender, uh, related to, I don't know, sexual orientation, whatever. They are all combined. And this is when the concept of intersectionality comes into play. So we can go back to Kimberly Crenshaw and decide that in 1989, she coined the, t the term intersectionality, right? And we need to credit her for that. But the, the idea of interconnecting issues predates Kimberly Crenshaw, right? It was before 1989 because people existed, people led their life, uh, people experienced their life as uh, you know, men, women, uh, straight or gay, uh, poor or wealthy, black or white, all those things. Th this is basic human experience. And I think that what the, um, those processes of racialization have done, most importantly, perhaps, is fragment, fragment people and things. As if, if you were a black person, you are not a full human being. Right? If you are a poor per person, you are not a, a real human being, with whiteness being the fullest form of humanity and blackness being the lessest, uh, I mean, the least form of humanity. Right? So all, these, um, all, all, all those, uh, those notions and all those categories, class, race, gender, they all come together. And if we need to wait for 1989 and an African-American woman to put a word on it and we, we want to cling to that, that's fine in terms of academia. But it doesn't mean that before Crenshaw, and I'm sure she would agree, there were people who have thoughts about that, right? My training, because my training was in the US and in African-Americans and African-American women, I know that um, what is called the uh, a club women movement, right? The first feminist African, I mean, no, not the first, but some organized feminists uh, who were African-Americans in the early 20th century already spoke about the double jeopardy. They were talking about race and sex, right? We are black people, but we are women. And even within um, the movement for racial equality, we seem to be left aside. Right, so this is just one example. So the, the concept of fragmentation, right, the fragmentation of humanity is also to be found in the linguistic fragmentation that Jamila spoke about. The fact that people from Brazil, because they speak, uh, you know, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, can be isolated from even other countries located in the Americas, right? So we cannot talk to Venezuela, we cannot talk to Argentina, we can, we, even though we still occupy the space. And the same thing unfolds when it, I mean, when you talk about the Caribbean, for instance, the Spanish presence in the Caribbean, the French presence in the Caribbean, the Dutch presence in the Caribbean, right? Uh, the English uh, supremacy in the north of the, uh, of the American continent. What do we make of that? So we need to think of that and we need to think about the same thing that unfolded, of course, in the European continent, but on the African continent itself, right? How do we, I don't know, how do we bridge those gaps? How do we bridge those linguistic gaps? How, how do we bridge those racial and those social gaps? There needs to be a form of internationalism, transnationalism. And there have been ex multiple examples throughout history Pan-Africanism is, is, um, is one of the example, is one of those examples of people who have thought beyond the national boundaries and beyond the linguistic boundaries, beyond the social boundaries. And this is the difficulty. And this is really the fit. This is really the victory of those colonial projects, how they were created and how they unfolded in what was called the New Worlds from the late 15th century on to fragment, because to fragment, is to um, 
let's say, hinder any type of communication of unity that doesn't serve the purposes, that doesn't serve the interests of the dominant power. That's just a fact. But of course, this, this attempt at launching uh, and putting into place total control over populations, over communities, over nation states, has also always been and systematically countered. Domination goes hand in hand with resistance. And they go hand in hand because both involve human beings. And human beings, even under the worst of circumstances, will find ways to resist those um, um, systems of domination through religion, education, literature, the arts. They will just, and, and those attempts at resisting is to me the affirmation, the assertion of their humanity. This is a constant reassertion of the humanity that is constantly being taken away from me. Me as an individual and as an individual, me as a community, me as a social class, me, me as a racial group. So this is to me how, um, this is why these, uh, the, the current circumstances can only take us back to the beginnings, to the beginnings. And, and, and the current circumstances are simply disclosing, unveiling, putting more obvious the system has, um, as it has been put into place centuries ago, right? And so I think that those questions are, are, are old questions that we have, you know, intellectual traditions, political traditions, artistic, religious, I mean, all types of traditions that have grappled with those, um, with, with those problems, those issues. And yes, it, it, it might be, it might be uh, convenient for us to remember them, to remember them, to not to think that we only have to invent a new world, right? Or a new way of being, but perhaps to draw from the past. I'm not saying to imitate the past. I'm not saying to go back to the past, but to have a greater awareness of this past to see how some solutions can be improved uh, and can be um, reinvented in, in, in the 21st century, right? If we think of Centuria that uh, Jamila uh, mentioned and all, all these uh, African-derived religions, they were not only displaced from the African continent to the Americas, they were transformed and they had to be transformed. So there are two positions here. There can be the focus on the loss Right, we have lost this. We have lost Africa. We have lost the original cultures. We have lost the languages. And what can we do? Can we recover them? Can we reclaim them? But we can also say yes. We have lo we have lost, and we have remade, remade. And this might not be authentic. This might not be pure. This might not be I don't know sufficient. But it might be. There's 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 a lot of beauty that has been produced that has been shared and that has allowed people to retain their dignity and to stay alive and to believe. If we, we think of religions and spirituality, what is the purpose of religion and what is the purpose of spirituality? For people to stay alive, to keep sane, to, for them to be, understand, to be able to understand life and the world, to make things bearable and all types of things whether it is the Middle Passage or whether it is the institution of slavery, whether it is the atrocity and all the horrors we, we know, people, most, uh, the vast majority of people have stayed alive. I'm not saying they were extremely happy, but at least most of them did not commit suicide. And most of them made a conscience, a conscience decision to carry on with their lives, right? And they have found ways. And I think that it is important to remember those ways. And it is important to um, not only focus on other places, what the Brazilians do towards the United States of America, the French do the, thing, the, the same thing. Only like the struggles um, that have been successful have only taken place in the United States. There is a documentation of the civil rights movement. And we see with this new example of how things are, how things intermingle, right? We have access to the United States of America because the United States of America is a hegemonic country. It is a powerful country. 
and it is a country of technology. So if we have the civil rights movement, we have the media coverage of the civil rights movement. Therefore, we have uh, material, we have footage that can circulate, that can be seen. And if you are, you are in a country where the, the technological um, situation is not the same, then you'll have less footage. But the footage doesn't mean that the things and the acts of resistance have not taken place. It means that they have not been preserved and they have not been sufficiently, I mean, not sufficiently, but document, documented in a way that can be shared with the country itself and with the larger community. So that is an issue. So all we have, the images we have, the books we have, uh, the um, you know, collective memory we have comes from that place, right? And sometimes the people from that place, they are aware of that and they will say, we're not the only experience, but sometimes they will not. And they have the means, that's all. The only difference is the means, the means to publish, uh, the means because right now we are talking about we are talking in English because this is the language, right? So they have the language too. Uh, they have the um, you, yeah. This is the hegemony. This is how how it it unfolds. So yes, we can we can look at the United States of America. We can look even at the uh, as the mo at the most remote margins, right? If if we're talking about African American women, African American feminists, we are talking about the margin of the margins. But even those margins are may hold more power than our situation in hexagonal France or in, in Brazil. So this is something that needs to be negotiated, not totally rejected, but negotiated and understood. We can think of the United States of America and we can think of the struggles and the, the battles that have been won because the focus on the civil rights movement is because it is a moment of victory. There have been victories. They were not sufficient victories, but there have been uh, victories. But even before the civil rights movement, there were acts of resistance in the early 20th century, in the late 19th century, mid 19th century, all the way, all the way, since the arrival of the first Africans in what was to become the United States of America, is to say in 1619, right? But our focus is the civil rights movement. We could look at Haiti, right? So Haiti doesn't seem to be too sexy right now because Haiti is poor and there are all these uh, you know, natural disasters. But in 1804, Haiti was the first black republic in the world and it was born out of a successful slave rebellion. The only slave rebellion in the United States that was strong enough to give rise or to give birth to a country, to a nation state. We could also remember that. You mentioned the Malay uh, rebellion of 1835. We could also remember that. We could, you, you know, all those things. So we need to have, um, I agree, I, 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 real, I'm, I realize that I'm, I've been talking for a while now, <laughs> but we, we need to talk more. We need to talk more and we need to understand each other more and we need to, to speak more languages. And we also need to include, let's say, translation as an act of resistance. Translation mm -hmm. as systematic. And, and, and mm -hmm. one of the examples that, that comes to mind is that of um, the Nardal sisters, uh, two women from Martinique who were in Paris in, uh, right before the Negritude movement and who held salons, uh, who received uh, intellectuals and artists from the Harlem Renaissance at the time, who hosted um, you know, the Césaire and the Sangor and the Damas. And what they did, what they, they, they were students in English in France. And what they did at the time was to translate. So now what we remember is the Negritude movement and all the, the fathers of the Negritude. And what we have forgotten as, uh, are, are the, precursor, the precursors of this Negritude woman, of this Negritude movement, sorry. And they happen to be women. And they happen to be um, black. And they translated. This is what they did. They, tra they translated so that the people in Paris and the black students at the time had access to what was happening in the United States of America. Right. Mm -hmm. So th these are the things that I wanted to say. Um, um, and perhaps one last point, the, in terms of the loss, what has been lost and what, what has been preserved and what can be transformed and reinvented. I think that the issue of the self cannot be, um, cannot, cannot be left aside. 
what I mean by the, the, the you know, the subjectivity, the sub, oh, subjectivity, I'm talking about uh, what Ashish Nandi from, from India, um, what, in his essay, Self and uh, Recovery of Self, in, I don't know, post-colonial, in colonial times, I, I can't remember the full, t the full text, but the full title, but it was really about how these modern times have also impacted and negatively impacted the self and the, the value, the worth that you give, that one gives to, it, to himself or herself, and therefore one gives to um, one's community. And I think that this, this, this um, look outward, this systematic look outward for something that is valuable also needs to be understood as this loss of self, loss of the value of yourself. Your culture, yourself is never, is what has been fragmented and, and is what needs to be recovered and, 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 and is what needs to be healed, valued. Mm -hmm. This is one of the major losses. And perhaps when doing so, yes, people will, will, will look at what they have at hand. Maybe my culture, my language, my surroundings, my environment, my community, is of value. I don't need to dream about being an African American because, as an Afro Brazilian, I will be enough. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on that too. This recovery of, of the self, the oh. collective oh. or and individual, but also individual. Mm -hmm. É muito, muito interessante essa fala da Mabula, porque leva a gente para a próxima questão, que é justamente sobre o livro que a Mabula publicou esse ano na França, que se chama Le Triangle et l'Hexagone, onde ela tem é, o, toda a narrativa, ela é bem pessoal, né, para chegar nas questões, em questões estruturais, assim. Então, entre outros assuntos, nesse livro, que poderia ser traduzido como o triângulo e o hexágono, porque faz referência ao comércio transatlântico, triangular, chamado triangular, e hexágono, porque a França é conhecida como o hexágono, né, é assim que os próprios franceses se referem à França, inclusive excluindo a parte que é fora do hexágono, né, nas Antilhas, por exemplo, na Ásia, enfim. E é nesse livro, Triângulo Hexágono, é, a Mabula vai, falar, vai fazer uma análise da incapacidade da França, ou melhor, de uma falta de vontade mesmo na França, em reconhecer a existência e em assumir as consequências de um sistema pelo qual ela contribuiu amplamente, que é o comércio triangular né, de escravos de corpos negros. Esse tabu afeta diretamente aqueles militantes e pesquisadores que tentam compreender, questionar e criticar esse passado e as suas consequências, acusando eles mesmos de serem é, racistas, né? porque, ele, porque se afirma que a sociedade é dividida e organizada racialmente. Então, a nossa questão agora, a questão que a gente pensou, é levar um pouco, já que vocês é, não só estão é, refletindo, pensando, mas vocês são extremamente ativas, militantes, né, antirracistas, é, pensar na, na força e nas consequências dessa, desse tipo de, de tabu, de preconceito, é, em relação ao percurso de vocês. Quando vocês apresentaram e defenderam as suas ideias, e defendem e apresentam ainda né, as suas ideias e trabalhos, tanto na academia quanto na sociedade, como é que se dá essa resistência? Eu lembro que a Djamila esteve na França né, um ano passado e um ano retrasado, se não me engano, então também teve contato com essa experiência e talvez... É, pode incluir isso, enfim, é uma questão sobre como é recebido o trabalho de vocês é, tocando em assuntos que são tão delicados. Je, je pose la question tout de suite en français. Oui. Euh, C'était vraiment très intéressant les, le, la discussion juste précédente et euh, votre réponse Mabula, nous amène euh, justement à ce troisième point qui est très lié à la question de la subjectivité dont vous parliez à l'instant, euh, de la subjectivité en tant que personne euh, en tant que personne euh, à de no très nombreuses multiples facettes et en tant que chercheuse aussi, euh, puisque dans, le, dans votre dernier livre, Le triangle et l'hexagone, euh, qui se réfère donc à cette forme triangulaire du commerce et à la forme hexagonale de, qui est assimilée à la France, et Nathalie a commenté à juste titre que l'hexagone exclut de fait euh, de bonnes régions françaises qui ne s'insèrent pas dans l'hexagone justement. Euh, donc dans cet ouvrage, vous vous analysiez d'une certaine manière euh, l'incapacité de la France, ou plutôt le manque de volonté de la France, euh, de reconnaître l'existence et d'assumer les conséquences de ce système de la réduction en esclavage des personnes et du commerce triangulaire auquel elle a largement euh, contribué. Et ce tabou, 
euh, touche directement le langage. Donc, si tout à l'heure, Jamila euh, disait qu'au Brésil, il est difficile de parler sérieusement de race, en France, il est tout simplement difficile de parler de race, en fait. Et donc, ce tabou euh, il touche directement les militants et les militantes, il touche directement les chercheurs et les chercheuses, en tout cas certains et certaines, qui tentent de comprendre, qui tentent d'interroger et de critiquer le passé esclavagiste et ses conséquences, et donc avec souvent des accusations du fameux racisme inversé ou au moins de discrimination raciale euh, envers ces personnes qui affirmeraient que si la société est divisée et organisée par la race, euh, sans défendre ça et en, affir en, en affirmant que ça existe. Donc, comment vous vous envisagez, Maboula et Jamil, la force et les conséquences de ce tabou, de cette impensée au moins, lorsque vous, vous présentez euh, votre expérience, que vous présentez votre parcours et que vous présentez vos travaux euh, dans le monde univers universitaire, puis aussi dans la société en général. Et on va commencer par Maboula, du coup, pour ensuite euh, passer sur euh, la réponse de Jamil. Je pense que je vais commencer par dire que one of the major differences between Brazil and France is, is the massive black or African descended presence. I think that this is the, perhaps the advantage or the privilege of, of, of blacks in the Americas is that they have been in the Americas for a long time, which doesn't mean that they have been well treated in the Americas, but at least they are part and parcel. Like even the mere fact, the mere fact of excluding, marginalizing the black populations is the marker of their presence, right? You have to manage them, you have to exclude them, you have to be violent toward them, but precisely because they are present. In France, the, 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 the situation is totally um, different, precisely because of this divide, because of this dichotomy between European France and other French possessions that are spread across the world, right? Is that is, it is as if France, the Republic, imagined itself only limited to Europe. And even only when uh, Melanie was doing the introduction to the question, it, it's, it's, it's not only about the European part of France. The, the hexagon is also an exclusion of Corsica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Corsica is in Europe, right? And, and, and we know how France has fought over the centuries to retain this island, right? That has had uh, throughout history, strong independentist movements, right? Independent movement. So even Corsica, I like this example because people never think about this, this, uh, this island, but even Corsica is left out of this hexagon, right? So the management of the black populations or non-white populations in France is totally different. Right. But it also, um, I mean, one of the similarities with Brazil is this reliance on, on a myth, a reliance of a non-reality uh, and an impossibility to deal with reality. If we go back to this issue of subjectivity and if we go back even to the very level of individuals, the discourse that is being held, produced, circulated within hexagonal France, Uh, when I was writing uh, the, the, this book was, if I believe what they say, I do not exist. I do not. I'm not talking about others. I'm not talking about the community. I'm not a, like me. I don't exist. Based on what they're saying, I do not exist. So how can I, let's say, resist this erasure, this systematic, this heavy, this, um, um, I don't know, Even strangling erasure. Every day I am alive, I live my life, and every day I'm being told directly or indirectly, um, in concrete terms or symbolically, that I do not exist. So the resistance to that, for me, has been to say, and even beyond saying, to write that I exist. I, I am going to write my life. I'm not the first one. There have been um, other, as we spoke earlier about the, this intellectual tradition and that I am fully aware of, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that in the 21st century, I'm just going to say and write that I am a black woman. Do I want to be a black woman? That's another question. But I decide that I am a black woman and that I have decided to be a black woman. 
most people throughout history have been made black without their approval, right? In those current times, in the 21st century, in this particular context, I would say that in light of the history, my uh, knowledge and my study and my practice as a, of course, yes, I am a scholar and I am a, a PhD and I, and I do research. Uh, in light of, of, of this legitimacy that is oftentimes uh, taken away from me, but I am still a PhD. They can do whatever they want. I have, <laughs> I have the title. And so in light of this legitimacy that I want to cling to, uh, in light of the rules that have been instituted and that I am only following, in light of this uh, society uh, that exists the way it does, in light of this history, I decide to be black and I will say, I will say it and I will write it. That's the act of resistance. So the, the consequences are not easy, but, but um, I knew exactly what I was getting into, Melanie, when I decided to, uh, to do so. And, and to me, that's part of the struggle and the struggle is not new. I'm not, um, I'm not naive. Uh, I am um, knowledgeable in what I do. And I know that uh, it's not a new thing. And I just, I'm just doing my share of, of the work. And people have done, uh, have done more. Uh, people have given their life for that. I'm not willing to give my life, but I'll write a book. <laughs> I'll write a book. <laughs> I'm not going to die for that. But I'm, 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 I write this book and I'll uh, perhaps try to uh, continue to break the silence. And, to, and I'll continue to... Um, to try to resist the the erasure, the erasure. Mm -hmm. This is really about uh, resisting the the the, the re revisionism and the erasure and the negations uh, of, of 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 this past and this present. Uh, if I am black, um, I am black because people have me have been made black, and just because. Uh, I don't know, slavery has disappeared, the slave trade has disappeared. It doesn't mean, I mean, this is, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It is as if, I don't know, for people to mourn if we took, if we took that, that horrible example. So you are in, a, or you have some type of relationship with a, another human being and they die today, April 23rd of, of, of 2020. And on, on Friday, April 24th, you're just fine. You're just fine. People died and their life is over and you continue, you carry on with your life. It's, uh, you're fine one day after that. So we can use the example of mourning. And we, we've, we've said uh, this issue, we have discussed this, this issue of uh, you know, having the right to life, to being entitled to life and death, right? So what happens when people die? If you get, I don't know, you're married, and you get a divorce, and the day the divorce is pronounced, everything is, 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 is fine and settled, right? Um, you're, you, you, I'm not going to take the example of losing a job. I'm go going to take the example of, of being hired somewhere, right? You get employed, and you were poor before, right? You were totally poor, and then you get this new position, so on day one of this position, your poverty is going to be erased just because after one month you get your salary, the salary you're going to get is going to erase all the previous years of poverty, right? What does it, this, this doesn't make any sense. So of course, the previous years, the previous decades, the previous centuries have an impact on our life today particularly as, as Jamila mentioned earlier, in terms of the distribution of wealth and distribution of death, death and wealth, how they are wealth. distributed. So wealth that has been built, that has been accumulated throughout centuries will have an impact on, 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 on wealth and poverty today. If I am the first PhD in my family, um, the beginning of accumulation of wealth and privilege begins with me only. 
So we'll see what will happen for my future generations. But the story begins in the 21st century when other people have had PhDs and have accumulated wealth centuries before. And they are in better social um, conditions that I find myself in. And they are in better economic conditions. And they are perhaps in better health conditions. And as a coincidence, <laughs> they, happens, they happen not to be black. It might be a coincidence. <laughs> or there are a la larger number of them who are not black. Huh. We don't refuse complexity, right? We say that blackness and whiteness is not only anchored in the bodies, they have also become concepts. So we don't refuse. When we talk about those, we don't refuse the complexity, right? We can accept the fact that uh, the president of, uh, of the perhaps mightiest country on earth at some point um, was an African-American man. And this, this, this access to power to an African-American man cannot erase the systematic structural inequalities that character, characterize the United States of America. It cannot. So yes, Barack Obama accessing the presidency of the United States may be seen as progress, as a move forward, right? He still has a black body. Okay, but in terms of the other black bodies, the Obama years were the Black, black Lives Matter years, <laughs> right? So we, I insist on the fact that we don't reject complexity. Race is not a simple issue. It's not an easy issue. There are the bodies and there are the symbolical meaning, the, the currency of, of, of those racial identities. So I think that when, we are, when people in our respective locations try to dismiss us, I think that they also, that they dismiss us too easily, that they dismiss us on, on the basis of bad faith, and that they also reject the intellectual conversation. This is not only a politics as they want to imagine it. This is not only about militancy and, and you know, like um, some hot-headed, you know, uh, activist. No, we are doing, we are the ones doing deep thinking. We are thinking deep. And I think that what hurts the most or what, what hurts me the most in this, um, these easy dismissals is the refusal of, of, of the deep thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could, we could disagree. Uh, it could be better if we didn't have, if there was no, not th those, um, if there were no urgent and, and highly significant political stakes, right? If political stakes, economic stakes, life stakes were not the uh, that. Yeah, I can hear Better. Yes. Now I can move What? That's okay, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But so I think that even if we were not talking, discussing mayor politics in terms of, 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 of um, intellectualism, there's something that is not thought. There's something that is not thought out. And, and this, is a, this is a shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, uh, very intense. Yes, I agree. And um, because here in Brazil, I think we can we can say that Brazil has a history of denial. You know, denial of uh, the impact of the slavery time. After the slavery time, they destroyed all the documents related to this time. So. As a black woman, I don't know if my ancestor came from Nigeria or from Angola and how it created um, a gap of identity for black people in Brazil. Um, so as Nabula said, for me, it's very important to face this denial, to break this, this silence. And 
you know, uh, European descent, Italian descent here in Brazil, he can he can uh, find out where, you know, I don't know his um, uh, ancestor came. Uh, I don't know. So how it's created in Brazil, a problem of identity for black people, because if you don't know where you are from, from where you came from, it's easier to go where people say that it's your place. And yet you have these problems here of the awareness of blackness in Brazil. Um, because due to the miscegenation, miscegenation and all of this idea of mixed people, they created this idea that, oh, we don't know who is black in Brazil. But the police always know who is black, you know, uh, the director of television, they always know who is black. Only when you are talking about empower ourselves, they, you know, they, they raise this idea that, oh, it's impossible to know who is black. So I think in Brazil, there is a, even in my family, I have people that don't know they are black. Uh, that they think they are not black. Uh, most of the people know they are black when they travel to Europe or to the United States. And here in Brazil is the way you look like. If you look like white, you are white. It's uh, even if your mom or father is black. So this problem in Brazil, it's of the awareness of, of, of blackness. It was um, very um, effective you know, to, to let black people away from this conversation. Um, for me, it was different. Since I was a little girl, I knew I was black. Uh, my father was from the black movement. He was one of the founder of the Com Communist, Party, Communist Party in Santos, the place who I was born. Um, so for, for me and my sister and my brother, my siblings, it is, um, it was a discussion that we had since we were uh, children. Um, but uh, in my home, in my house, my father was black, my mom was black. You know, I have an African name because my father was an activist. My sister has an African name. And for us, it was an easy conversation inside of our house. But when I went to school, um, I don't know, maybe around six years old, I felt the, the consequence, consequence of being a black girl mm. uh, and how it was very difficult for me, the violence Sorry. that I, I suffered Sorry. and how um, the way they told us the history of Brazil, like um, mm. African people were enslaved and that's it. Um, then the princess Isabel, she was very important because they make black people free and all this idea. So for me, it was also a conflict because in my home, I had my father and my mother uh, explain to us the black history, explain to us that we are beautiful, you have to enjoy the way you are. But outside my house, it was all that, you know, the, the, the races that we had to, to face. Um, so for me, it was very difficult during the childhood, and even when I was a teenager, to have the confidence to break the silence. Um, of course, I did that sometimes, but, also, but always feeling that I was not um, being part of the place uh, I, I, I was. It was very difficult, um, difficult feelings to, to, to deal. Um, what changed for me it was that when I was 19, maybe 20 years old, I started working in an NGO, a black feminist NGO. And for me, it was very, very important because there I think I had the confidence to break the silence because it was presented to me the work of black women. Uh, the work of black feminists, of black women, black activists in Brazil. The name was um, Casa de Cultura da Mulher Negra, something like uh, House of Culture of Black Women, something like that. And for me, it was very important that place to, to, um, to make me rethink my blackness, 
because I knew I was black. It was not a, I, I, I didn't have doubt about that. But the thing is uh, the, the fear that sometimes I was experiencing, the fear sometimes to raise my hand to answer a question in school, uh, the fear to be intelligent, the fear to be, you know, I know what I'm doing. So after this NGO, I think my life, um, uh, I think my life, I think I, I, I brought some meaning to, to my life, you know, to, to see my history from the black woman eyes. And it was very important to me. And, uh, and it was how I took uh, all the decisions I had in my life, even in academia or the, my activism came from this place. Um, and then I decided to, you know, to be an activist. I decided to, you know, to study. But um, as the most of Black women in Brazil, I had the opportunity to study, to go to college, you know, near my 30s. I, 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 I started the philosophy course when I was 27, 20 years old. And I had, my daughter was three years old. And at that time, I was married to the, my daughter's father. And it was a very difficult situation to me to choose to study. So that time, I felt, you know, the, the sexes in my life. Of course, I have experienced it uh, a, a lot of times because I am a Black woman. But in that time, even inside a Black family, it was very difficult to me to study and to say I'm going to study because my child was little, because I was living in a different city from the university and I had to travel to go to the university and how people were discouraging me to do that. And it was very difficult situation for me to say, no, I'm going because I'm the first person in my family to have the opportunity to study and I'm breaking this cycle because my mom was a domestic work worker before get married, my father. My grandmother was a domestic worker. My grand-grandmother, the cycle was breaking my generation. And because I had the opportunity to study because um, we had a government in Brazil at that time um, who created some um, public policy in terms of education. So I'm a part of this generation, of this generation of black people had the opportunity to study due to these policies. Uh, so it was very difficult, but I did. I actually, I decided to study even with all the residents in my house. Uh, and I, I always do this joke, that's why it's an ex-husband now. And, um, but at that time, how it was difficult to me to, you know, to deal with the pressure of being the first person in the family to study. Uh, to, to be a mom who was studying left in the child with, that, with and her father and oh my god how can you do that and you are here studying philosophy something that you are not making money with that and all this uh, depression but um, I decided to face that and how it was important to me but I think it's important to say because people see me now and think that everything was easy that is still are easy, but it's not easy at all. And even in the, in the philosophy course, when I decided to just study female philosophers, black philosophers, and had to face uh, the department, I had to deal with, you know, things like that. Oh, it is not philosophy. Oh, this, this is the activist studying, the girl who wants to start gender issues and how it was difficult to keep myself, you know, focus on my thesis, in my dissertation. I defended my dissertation in 2015. I was already 35 years old, you know, and almost uh, 40 years. And how it was for me difficult to deal with all these issues. Um, and then after that, um, I decided to you know, to use the visibility that I got the past few years to make other people work visible. That's what I'm doing now to break the silence because I don't want to be alone in this place. 
and there is a lot of hate in Brazil. Being a black woman who thinks, writes, um, we uh, we receive a lot of hate. It's not difficult. Sometimes even inside the community, it's crazy because you know I am a feminist. That are part of the community that are not feminists, so they think, yeah, you know that feminists uh, are imitating white women, and they, they do not understand about black feminists. So it's not a comfortable place uh, to be. But on the other hand, when I see that in the past two years, I've published 90 black authors, men and women, female and male, and how these authors are, you know, doing the racial debate visible in Brazil, so I feel, you know, I can feel sometimes moments of joy because I don't want only to feel moments of pain, of hate. I want to feel moments of joy and to see, yes, like, like Lelia, Gonzalez, Lelia Gonzalez used it to, to say, yes, the garbage will speak in, in a good way. It's okay. I'm going to speak in a good way, deal with that. I think now I am in this position to not be so affected by the hate of the the people here in Brazil, I know that um, I have uh, a place, I am exception, I'm pretty sure, because I write for the major newspaper in Brazil, I have a weekly column in this newspaper, and I write for um, a major published house in Brazil, although I have my ind independent project. Um, I know that it's, uh, there are few of us in these places, but I try to use these places to talk about the issues that usually the other people do not do, do not speak about. So I try to use my column in this newspaper to talk about the black thinkers, to talk about quilombolas, to talk about indigenous people, but not only in the way to, you know, to denounce what's going on, but in the way to present these people. I don't want uh, I, I don't want to be the people, the person and who only, you know, denounce, because usually people want us in this place, and I don't want that. I, I, I want to be able to speak um, about, you know, love, about uh, outer lot books, or about, you know, talking about a song that I like, talking about a singer that I like, and I, I had to face this stereotype that people put on us, that if you are an activist, a black activist, you, you, you only can exist if you are there doing this or doing that. Oh, I am not going to talk about that. I'm not going to write about that. So today I can say, no, I'm not going because I am spending some time with my daughter. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, as a black woman, I think it's important to me to not put myself in this place to attend other people's demands, what other people want from me. And um, of course, it was not easy to, to, to do that, but I think now that I will complete 40 years, I am you know, ready to do that and it's okay. It doesn't make me less activist you know, to take, um, take care of myself. Uh, my mother, she didn't have the opportunity to take care of herself. She had four children, she had to work, she had to take care of us. My father was a doctor, he had to work. Uh, both of them died when they were very young. Uh, my mom was 51, my father was 52. In consecutive, consecutive, consecutive years, they died. Um, so I want to be alive, you know, I want to raise my daughter. She's 15 now. I want to you know, to, to, to see the developing of my daughter. I want to, to be able to take care of her. I want to be able to provide her um, opportunities. So for me, as a, uh, for me today, it's important to balance the activism and to balance my personal life and to say that I have the right to take care of myself. Um, because in Brazil, you have this idea of the strong black woman, the warrior black woman. 
oh, black women, they are, you know, they are very strong naturally. And how it's, it's not human to say that because we need to be strong because the state is violent. We need to be strong because we need to take care of our family when the black, black men are being shot by the police. We need to be strong. But on the other hand, it's important to say that if we naturalize this strength of the black women, we are not uh, responsible, the government, the state, for the violence that they are you know, doing to black people. Um, so, in, and also as a religion from Candomblé, uh, Afro-Brazilian, and who uh, was raised in Candomblé, um, I think it's important to, to value the moments of joy. Candomblé, you have to work a lot when you have the rituals, you have to work, you have to, you know, to prepare a ritual, there are a lot of work, but you have the time of the party, you have the time that the Orisha comes and they dance, they sing. So Kanoblé for me is not only a religion, it's, always, uh, it's also a way to see the life, you know, that is the time to work, this is the time to party, this is the time to be quiet because we have some rituals that we stay isolated from, you know, one month for weeks that you have to stay with you yourself in a room alone. Um, and you have the moment that you, you leave this ritual, that you meet the other people in the tejero. So I think it, for me to see life through Candomblé helps me a lot um, to face what I have to face here in Brazil. Because I mean, when I'm not feeling okay, I can call my priest and say, I need some time to stay in the tejero. When I am happy, I celebrate with my people. So I think it's, um, for me, it was important to find this balance. And I think I found this balance in through Candomblé. And um, the God and the Goddess, they are different from each other. They have different, um, uh, traits, and that's why I don't want a black woman to be like me. I can accept the fact that she's different, that she can have a different perspective than they mine. So uh, it's not easy. We are living under Bolsonaro government. Um, we, they are taking the rights. We are living a very difficult situation in Brazil now, in this government, in this fascist government. Uh, but I think what helped me to, to, to go on is to not uh, lose the historical perspective. I want to learn from Quilombolas. They had to resist from slavery. I want to learn from the past, as Mabula said. I want to learn from my ancestor who had to face um, even more difficult times that we are living now. So that's the way I think. I think it's important to learn from the past to how to create new strategies to deal with the present. And, um, and I think it, today um, I am being able to do that, more comfortable uh, without, you know, try to please this side or the other side. And, uh, just to, to understand that I have the right to be myself. I am a black woman, I understand the structural issue, I fight against the racist, but I am an individual. And to respect the individual, individual that I am today, I think it's um, um, how I'm dealing with this moment right now and how I deal right now in my work um, in Brazil, at the same time that I'm a writer, I publish other people, but I have the time to write for myself, to write my own book, and to understand this, you know, how to balance the, the collective issue with the individual issue. Wow, <laughs> muito bom ouvir vocês, muito bom. Bom, a gente vai passando, eu acho, para a última pergunta, é, e vai mudar um pouquinho talvez, mas caminhando para uma reflexão final, que é uma pergunta ligada aos desafios da língua, né, do idioma, da semântica, das palavras. 
Hoje a gente teve que adaptar essa dinâmica dos debates para a gente conseguir se entender, então as questões foram feitas em francês e em português e as, o debate está tá acontecendo em inglês, porque é a língua comum né, do, das, duas, uh, das nossas duas convidadas. Isso já traz alguns problemas, por exemplo, quando nós temos que traduzir conceitos, por exemplo, a dinâmica americanidade, como falar em inglês e em francês, então... É, enfim, mas é, é assim. É, isso é ainda mais importante quando nós tentamos pensar as questões raciais nos contextos africanos, europeus e americanos, algo que já foi mencionado até na discussão, né? Como se comunicar é, tendo questões em comum, mas, enfim, a línguas diferentes. É, ou então, analisar os usos e as proibições em torno do termo raça em ciências sociais e nas sociedades em países diferentes. Então, se as palavras que nós usamos, sem dúvida, têm poder esse poder se diluiria pela tradução ou quando nós temos que falar outra língua, ele se reinventaria, ele se perderia. E aí tem mesmo, a, a Jamila foi traduzida em francês recentemente e aí tem diferenças também né, no, no próprio título do texto. Então, é refletir um pouco sobre isso. Então, on, va, on, va, on avance progressivement dans le, dans le, dans le à peu près 15 000 questions à vous poser à toutes les deux, mais on va, on va s'arrêter euh, avec cette dernière question, euh, qui est euh, vraiment liée à, à toutes ces expériences personnelles et professionnelles que vous nous avez, euh, dont, vous, dont vous avez parlé toutes les deux, puisque la question du parcours, est, elle est forcément liée à la manière dont on la raconte, et donc ça nous amène à, à une question davantage liée, Bon, on en a parlé hein, de manière transversale dans, dans, tout le, enfin, dans tout le débat, mais euh, une question davantage liée au défi sémantique et de la langue des mots. Euh, Aujourd'hui, par exemple, les questions sont posées en français et en portugais, et le débat, vos interventions à toutes les deux ont lieu en anglais, puisqu'il s'agit de la langue commune, et donc c'était un choix qu'on a fait, évidemment, mais qui, qui, qui comportait des avantages et des inconvénients. Et ce n'est pas sans poser problème à l'heure notamment de traduire des, con des concepts employés par l'une ou l'autre, à l'heure de jongler entre les traditions linguistiques. C'est encore plus flagrant dans le cas qui nous occupe quand on essaye de penser les questions raciales dans les contextes européens, latino-américains, euh, ou, ou d'analyser les emplois et les interdits caractéristiques du terme « race ». Et ça, c'est vraiment euh, le cas en France. Euh, un terme qui est quand même beaucoup plus utilisé dans le cas brésilien, même si l'utilisation de son terme comporte aussi des grosses difficultés dans le débat et dans la société au Brésil. Mais euh, en sciences sociales et dans la société française, c'est très compliqué d'utiliser le terme de race. Euh, donc, si les mots que nous employons ont certainement et euh, inéb... enfin, indéniablement du pouvoir, est-ce que ce pouvoir se diluerait d'une certaine manière ou au contraire se réinventerait par les traductions et par la question des échanges comme ça linguistiques euh, tels qu'on est en train de le pratiquer euh, aujourd'hui on, on commence peut-être par Jamil et on termine par euh, Mabola en changeant ce qu'on a fait tout à l'heure okay, on a ah. je... Começou pela com a Mabula da outra vez. Ué, acho que pode ser. Uhum. A Jamila pode começar. Uhum. As, um, my three books were translated to French. Uh, last year I had the opportunity to, to go to France twice to do the, the book tour. And for me it was very um, interesting, but on the other hand, I was very surprised to see that in France, how they deal with the racial debate. Yeah, you cannot talk about race uh, in France. For me, it was uh, quite uh, surprising to, to, to see that. Um, because in Brazil, this is not uh, an issue anymore in terms of research in academic works. We understand that it's important to talk about race, even to, um, uh, you know, when you are going to think about public policy, you need to know how black people live. You need to know, you need the, the, these data to even to think about public policy. And in Brazil, although you have all this historical of denial, although you have all these problems about, you know, um, creating myths about the harmony of hate races, uh, it's not an issue anymore. It's not a taboo to do that. So we can say in Brazil, uh, of course, people 
uh, we do not we do not have the same you know spaces. You do not have in some departments. Uh, I've studied philosophy, even in philosophy, even today in Brazil, it's very difficult to have this conversation in philosophy departments in different universities in Brazil. Uh, of course, in social science, people do it more. There are a lot of works on race in this area. In philosophy, it's still difficult in Brazil, but in other areas, it's not so difficult. Um, and how in Brazil, which was important in terms of uh, public policy in the last few years, talk about race. Uh, the, we had some public policies that were very important to black people, especially during the labor party government. Um, so for me, it was very strange, you know, sometimes in some debates in France to, to try to explain to people why in Brazil um, is not a a problem to talk about race and um, how people sometimes in France were, you know, um, uh, how can I say, they were not comfortable about this conversation. Ah, but you cannot talk about race because uh, it's, they, we are, it's, uh, it's racism to talk about race. And for me, it's um, um, Quite difficult sometimes to, because for me it's so easy to have this conversation here, you know. So I had to to find different ways to explain our contest and to say that if you don't know how black people live in France, how we're going to, you know, think about improve the life of black people in France. And so it's a uh, for me it was a interesting experience to to to, to see that and how. I had to, to rethink about that. Um, I think it's uh, the problem, of course, the language, when you translate a word, sometimes you can lose some ideas, but I think it depends on who is translate that. That's why I think it's important for me that my translator in French is a black woman. So I think it's important. Uh, it's not because a white person could not do that, but I think that the social place that you, you are, you have different kind of experiences and views of life. So I think it's important to me to have a black woman that I can talk about some issues that are not a surprise for her. Um, that's why um, my book, my first book now is, is being translated to Italian. For me, it's important to know who is the person who is going to translate my work. If the person is familiar to, to, to the racial debate, and I think it is important to, to take care of that. Uh, this first one, La Place de la Parole Noir, the, the name is different. Uh, in Brazil, it's, it's just La Place de la Parole in Brazil, in Portuguese. Um, my, trans, my editor put the noir because, you know, La Place de la Parole is, is not a concept that are so familiar to French people. That's why she decided to, to use uh, noir. This one, um, the name in Portuguese is Who is Afraid of Black Feminists? But in French it's just Chroniques uh, de Feminisme Noir because, you know, we thought together, me and my editor, that maybe Black feminism is not so popular in French like it's in Brazil now. So maybe to say who is afraid of black feminism, sometimes people would, hmm. Uh, this title, I don't know if I agree with this title, but if the people read, the, 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 you know, so it's a way to bring people to read the book. Some strategy that we, we, we found that would be interesting to, you know, to invite people to read the book, and when you read the book, they will see that we are talking about black feminists. So my editor thought it was better to do it in France, in France and I agreed, uh, because here in Brazil, uh, although you have all these issues in the past few years that were more, you know, black people writing in Brazil, that they are translating more black women from different countries. Uh, I think it's important to say that uh, Women, Race and Class, the Angela Davis book was translated into Portuguese in 2016. 
but the book was original published in the United States in 1981. So it's very recent in Brazil. Um, uh, the the racial debate being more visible, very recent. And I was part of the book, part of the group who, you know, fight for have these translations in Brazil because the, the public houses, the chiefs, the heads, the chiefs of the public houses, they had this idea of, oh, the, these books are not going to sell. Black people do not sell. So we had to prove to them that, you know, black people sell in Brazil. But after this experiencing of being part of this project of Angela Davis' book, I decided to have my own project with other people because that published house was, you know, uh, the chief was a white, a white person who only wanted to, you know, make money with this book but didn't have, you know, um, you know, they only translate the people from, translate people from the United States. They are, not, they are not publishing Brazilian black people. And this is my issue. They translate because in Brazil you have this, you know, uh, this idea to value everything that comes from outside. Oh, she's black, but she's American. Oh, she's black, but you know, she's professor at Harvard, the United States. And you have a lot of black people doing important work here, but they don't see these people. So in Brazil, you have this kind of thing, you know, to value everything that comes from Europe or the United States. Um, that's why I decided to, to create a, a book seal. The name is Sueli Carneiro Seal. It's um, Sueli Carneiro is a very important black feminist in Brazil. I decided to honor her in life because usually they honor black women when they pass away. Decided to honor her in life and decided to publish black uh, men and black women in Brazil. And now even being an independent project, the books are being, um, most of the books are best seller in Brazil. And we decided to face the, um, the editorial market in the way we think our books. The, the prices are very affordable because mm -hmm. we know that black people cannot buy, you know, they don't have money sometimes to buy books. So the prices are affordable. The language is very, you know, we, we write in a way that people will understand without, you know, this academic language. Um, and we do some events, uh, not only in bookstores, because there are people in Brazil that never had the opportunity to go to a bookstore. We're talking about a country, 200 million people, a lot of people who didn't have the opportunity to study uh, they have the opportunity to, you know, to have a good education. So we do some events, you know, in public, public spaces, in um, poor neighborhoods. Uh, we do events with music. We do events with joy. Uh, breaking this idea that an intellectual is a person very intelligent and distant from the other people, from the mortals. So to break this idea. So that's why I think people go to our events. That's why I think people buy our books because they can see themselves um, and they can feel that this, these books are from them. And um, it's not easy to do that because you, you, you didn't have any kind of institutional support. We are in the independent, but in the other hand to see even a teenage girl reading a book and even an older woman reading the book um, to, for us, it's very, you know, uh, important. And uh, I was the first one to be translated. And then we had another author from the collection, Plural, Fem Fe Plural Feminist Collection, who was translated to French, Joyce Bert. And now we have a third one. Um, Hogeny William, who wrote about cultural appropriation. So my goal is, you know, to be able to translate all the authors and 
to translate Brazilian thinking. Usually we import the, 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 the critical reflection from other countries. For me, it's important to export the Brazilian critical reflection on race. Um, for me, it's a way to uh, giving a different meaning from the transatlantic, you know. Now we are coming back, but coming back with our books, with our critical reflections as Brazilian people, um, as black Brazilian thinkers and how it's important to make this production um, available for other people in diaspora. Of course, you have this problem of, we are going to translate, to, to, to do some translation to Portuguese. We wanted to translate Latin American women. We wanted to translate our, our black women from the diaspora, maybe. We can talk after <laughs> about your book, maybe. Uh, because I think it's important to, to present to Brazilian audience, to Brazilian people, different thinkings from different women from different parts of the world. So uh, that's what we are working now and trying to have black translators or, you know, people who are familiar with these issues to translate our work and to translate the work, uh, the work from other people. Because Audre Lorde, I think Audre Lorde was the first black thinker in Brazil who was translated by a black woman. Angela Davis was not, um, Bell Hooks was not, Toni Morrison was not, Maya Angelou was not. I think Audre Lorde was the first last year to be translated by a black woman. And I think it's important to, to put black people people who work on racial debate to translate our work. Abula, on va, on, on termine avec, euh, avec vous, un peu sur cette euh, question des mots aussi, et des traductions. Oui, I think, I think translation is, is, is key. Uh, it's a very important um, matter uh, to me because translation is communication. So the more you are translated, the more you can be circulated, so the larger the number of people you can reach. So to me, translation is very important, but the problem is that uh, translation can be very problematic if the goal and if the accepted objective is to, to travel, to circulate, um, under which senses do we want to travel? And, 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 and so translation is also highly political because how do you translate? Who do you translate? When do you choose to translate? And how are you translated? And to me, to translate is to understand. So I think that the stakes of translation, particularly for, for people, for, for black people and people from the diaspora, is enormous because we are talking about um, people who are unseen, people who are marginalized, people who are mistreated. So how will those people be translated? And will those translation reinforce or will they correct? Will they improve the vision that we have of those people and communities, right? So I agree with what uh, Jamila said when she says, I want to be translated by a black person, but I would go perhaps a little further. I want to be translated by a black person, but I want to be translated by a um, conscious, conscious black person. I want to be translated mm -hmm. by somebody who has decided to be black. Right? Again, it's, it's not only about the body, Right? Because in this case, anybody who has the knowledge, the, knowledge, the deep knowledge, I think that the issue of, of, of anchor is important. So also somebody who is black, somebody who has decided to be black. Because of course the experience and the personal trajectory of the translator is a reflection of the social order. So if you are a professional translator, or perhaps not even a translator, uh, not, not even a professional translator, 
because you cannot be a translator because as a black person you will not have had access to certain things or even within your training as a translator we all know whether we're talking about um you know at least brazil and france that you will not have been trained in literatures that's not part of the classic curriculum so you can get a degree uh in translation you can get a position mm -hmm. in translation without having been trained on particular uh on specific forms of literatures so i think that it is important to have people who yes might have experienced themselves blackness so it's not only about being black it's about accepting black right accepting to write uh your dissertation as jamila described in those particular conditions i am a single mother or i am i do not have support and of course i will do my um, you know my, my my degree better than you know the the, the classic uh, student right i understand that and i make the conscious decision to still uh, undertake training and to write my work on understudied Philosophers. Uh, that's the price, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. decision to write a dissertation on a topic that will most likely not even guarantee you a position in the university. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 like you're doing everything that needs to be done, but that will, in, in normal, under normal circumstances, will not. Oh, have you gained anything? Mm -hmm. you will not be paid for that. You will not be tenured for that. You will not, unless you get lucky. You know, Jamila is lucky today. I'm lucky, but we. Most people do unpaid work. Most people do unrecognized work. Most people do things that will not get them any attention. So, of course, so I I am all in favor of of translation, but I am a. How can I say? Very, have a lot of doubts. Have a lot of doubts uh, about the translation because of the things that I've, I've done. How can you? When I was a graduate student for for a while, I considered undertaking um, audio, you know, like audio video, not not video, cinema translation, because I saw what this could do to a movie. So I saw uh, the movie Bamboozled by Spike Lee, which is not one of his most famous movies, but I think it's one of the best. And, 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 and the, 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 I'm not even talking about the dubbing, I'm talking about the, the subtitles. They killed everything in the movie. And I think they killed the movie because they did not understand the movie and they did not understand the movie. I remember that um, Zora Nixon, so one of the monuments in African-American literature, literature published Their Eyes Were Watching God, which is a beautiful title. And Their Eyes Were Watching God in the first translation in France was translated as um, a black woman. <laughs> How can you do that? How can you go from <laughs> Their Eyes Were Watching God to a black woman, right? I'm thinking about uh, even more recently, Tanaisi Coates, who uh, published the bestseller um, Between the World and Me, another beautiful title, a title taken from a poem from Richard Wright, right? Between the World and Me, and that becomes uh, a black anger in France. <laughs> so there, there is politics behind this translation. What are people doing when they are choosing those titles? And what are they missing? And to, yeah. to, to hold on or to cling, to recapture what is being overlooked. And what is being overlooked be beyond the politics is also the beauty. Mm -hmm. so depriving yourself, and they are depriving us from the beauty, from the complexity. Translation is a very complex exercise. It's very hard. So why cannot these, um, you know, the, the skills that translation require requires? Why couldn't those skills be applied to all literatures? What some, you know, why can you translate uh, Shakespeare beautifully and try to render the beauty of Shakespeare 
And why would you, would you use lesser means for particular literatures and particular literatures that come from the people who happen to be commonly, frequently, regularly, systematically mistreated? That's another form. This is another form of racism. Mm -hmm. This is another form of mistreatment. Right. I'm also thinking about um, Marlon James and his uh, novel, uh, A Brief Killing, Brief Story of Seven Killings. I can't remember uh, the exact title. Yes, A Brief History of Seven Killings, which was totally killed in the French translation because the, 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 the novel takes place between Jamaica and the United States. And the novel contains a lot of Jamaican patois, a Jamaican phrase. And the translator obviously had no idea about Jamaican patois. And she translated it without even thinking about the French Creole that exists and that cannot be regarded if you think that France is a hexagon to begin with. But you could have looked at Martinique, at, at Guadeloupe, you could have looked at a Reunion Island as a French person, but you don't because you can only think about you know, Paris or Bordeaux or Marseille. So there, there is um, the stakes is high for, for, for translation. It's highly political. And, and I think that um, it, it, is, it is a tool that we need to uh, control and master to preserve um, the complexity, the beauty, uh, and the, um, you know, the content of, of, of what is being produced. And, 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 and translating is to understand is to respect. So you need to know those cultures. You need to know those communities and people for you to even have the right to, to, to translate anything. That's minimum. That's the basis. And those, those foundations work for a lot of other literatures, right? And why couldn't they work uh, for, for others? So this is part of the, of the global problem. This is one of the global problems, but people need to be trained, people need to work hard, and people need to get, you know, those, those contracts and those contacts with publishing houses to render, uh, to make justice to what is produced. So I think, yes, uh, you know, translating is, is communicating, and we want to communicate, but we want to communicate on the basis of truth. And truth yeah. is... is is reality. What we want is reality. Truth is reality. In, in French, uh, vérité and réalité are synonyms. They are synonyms. We want to have the truth and not only the, what is, con, you know, if we don't want the conception, if we don't want the stereotypes, if we don't want the prejudice, we need to, to have access to the truth and to, um, to be able to render the world views. The world views. How do Afro Brazilians see the world? What is uh, at stake in Condomble? What is? We need to understand that. We need to delve into that, so that we can try to find the equivalent in the French language. But to do that, we need to be able to say that Condomble is not voodoo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But we need to be sure about that. So we need to be knowledgeable in those African-derived religions of the Americas. So we need to study them. We need to learn from them. We need, they need to be taught. So that goes, that takes us to what is being taught in universities and higher education institutions. And so that, that all those questions always test, take us back to the, the systematic aspect. Of, of the question, the global aspect of it. We, we, we began with coronavirus, we can talk about education, we are talking about translation, with a, it's, it's the same problem. It's the same. Translation is a war. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree, yeah. Translation is a war, there's so many you're talking on behalf, you're talking for someone, and how are you betraying those pers this person? Are you talking with them? It's not only translation as, I, I, I teach translation, 
it's not you can have all the words you can have a dictionary at your you know disposal it's not going to make you a good translator mm -hmm. that's not the point you need some sensibility you need some Im immaterial knowledge you need if you're talking about particular communities the least you can do is to know about those communities otherwise otherwise this is um to me this is a very violent assault mm -hmm. and thinking that my knowledge or the general knowledge the mainstream knowledge that i have that i have acquired in this mainstream society is enough to make justice and that would be a, um, a negation of uh, I, I think uh, what I was saying is that for people not to take into account, like relying on the mainstream and mainstream knowledge, mainstream training, and is a negation and, 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 and is being blind to the history treatment and mistreatment of knowledge as being produced by particular communities. So you cannot act as if nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. If you don't know about those communities, it's because you were not taught about those communities. And the reason why you were not about those communities is because they do not matter, because they have been constructed as inferior, as irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Once you're translating them, you need to be at least humble and understand that you have a lot of catching up to do before you allow yourself to translate them. That, so, yeah, my take on translation. Yes, I would repeat translate, translation is a war, and, 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 and translating and translating well is part of the acts of resistance. Mm -hmm. And we have multiple examples of things that have been mistranslated. And we have seen, we have witnessed in human history how in encounters uh, between differing bodies, there have been mistranslations that Africans have been misunderstood by Europeans, that Native American populations have been misunderstood, misread, therefore mistranslated by this Western gaze. Mm -hmm. So this needs to stop. Bon, je crois que on pourrait on, on pourrait continuer encore. <rire> ça ne donne pas du tout envie de terminer la conversation, mais euh, on ne veut pas non plus euh, monopoliser votre temps à toutes les deux euh, pendant euh, toute la soirée, malgré le fait que, que ce soit vraiment une question extrêmement intéressante. Et puis c'est vrai que les questions qu'on a essayé de qu'on a posées avec Nathalie, les, les thématiques qu'on voulait aborder, elles, euh, elles recouvrent. Euh, de, de, de réflexion, c'est intéressant de faire des ponts et de penser de manière un petit peu transversale entre toutes ces questions-là. En tout cas, euh, je, au nom de, du petit groupe Histoire en quarantaine que nous sommes, donc Nathalie, euh, Paolo César Gomes, Olufes, Lucas, en français, et Carlos, euh, Carlos Benitez, Lucas Pedretti, Paolo César Gomes, Nathalie Guerreros et moi-même, Mélanie Toulouat, on voulait vous remercier toutes les deux extrêmement, extrêmement chaleureusement d'avoir accepté de participer à cette conversation avec les aléas que ça implique et le, les petits problèmes techniques et le, le, le fait d'être virtuellement présent. On espère sincèrement que peut-être ça pourra donner, donner lieu à une deuxième version présentielle un jour qui sait dans les mois à venir. Avec plaisir. Et, euh, et voilà, on voulait très, très sincèrement vous remercier toutes les deux. J'ai laissé la parole à Nathalie pour faire la traduction en, en portugais, du coup, cette fameuse traduction. <rire> Elle m'a raison, ma version. Hein, de... 
Mas, é, como a Melanie falou, foi muito rico, a gente poderia ficar aqui muito tempo conversando sobre inúmeros outros assuntos. Na verdade, a gente tinha mais questões e a gente cortou para... Porque eu, eu nem sei quantas que... horas já está aí. Já é, é, Mas é, nós aprendemos muito, eu aprendi muito, foi muito bom. Até chorei ali, vai ficar gravado. Mas... Muito obrigada a vocês, a Melanie falou o nosso agradecimento em nome da equipe, nós somos cinco, eu, Natália Guerelos, a Melanie, Melanie Turuá, é, Carlos Benites, Lucas Pedretti e Paulo César Gomes, que coordena o projeto, e, e é isso, acho que é tudo, não sei se eu esqueci alguma coisa.